The series we are doing, as you will recall from last evening, is on the kingdom of God and the teaching of Jesus. <clears throat> it is a series that does not conveniently package, necessarily at least, into, into blocks of four hours, so we are right in the middle. But in order for us to get up to this place where we are right at this moment, let's see if we can <clears throat> recapitulate in less than three minutes what we did last night. Remember, the first thing that we <clears throat> indicated was how crucial understanding the kingdom of God is if we're going to understand Jesus. That is, all the evidence in the Gospels leads us to the same conclusion <clears throat> that whatever else Jesus was about, he was about the coming of the kingdom of God. Since that's true, it, became, it becomes imperative for us then to understand what that means. So you'll remember we went to Mark's little summary in Mark 1.15 and began with the first sentence, the time is fulfilled. Spent a large part of our time last evening showing how <clears throat> the messianic expectations, the hope for the end that had arisen in Judaism, how it had finally come into focus in the time of John the Baptist and then Jesus. <clears throat> then what we did was to look at the second sentence in that summary, the kingdom of God is at hand. And the first thing we did was to show that the term kingdom of God does not mean what one might ordinarily think it means <clears throat> in our languages that tend to use that, that phrase to have to do with a realm, a place, a geographical or spatial term. Rather, we suggested that all of the evidence leads us to the conclusion that it has to do primarily with the rule of God, God's reign, the time when God exercises His rule in the affairs of mankind. Now, right at that point, we were indicating that the difficulty that we have is then when Jesus says, this time of God's rule, the kingdom of God, is at hand. What can that mean? And our problem is that, of course, the language at hand means that it was there. It was there in, the, in a presentness in the ministry of Jesus. Our problem with that is that the teaching of Jesus itself is full of ambiguity. On the one hand, <clears throat> there are those considerable number of sayings that we took about 10-15 minutes with last night indicating that the kingdom of God is still a future event. It has to do with the time in the future when there's going to be the great reversal of the order of life, for example. Uh, when <clears throat> the, the, the great banquet uh, that uh, the people who don't expect to be there are going to be there sitting at table. Uh, the coming of the Son of Man yet in the future. The requirement of watchfulness. Those and many, many other sayings that indicate that for Jesus himself, the kingdom of God was still a future event. Now, we were right at the point where we were going to emphasize that just as importantly and significantly, and this is where the difficulty lies, it is equally clear that for Jesus himself, the kingdom of God was in fact a present reality. Now, that's what we want to begin with tonight. <clears throat> the presentness of the kingdom in the ministry of Jesus. Let us begin with a couple of texts that make this absolutely certain. The first of these is in uh, Luke 17, verses 20 and 21, a text that we'll make note of. I happen to have the RSV in front of me, and we'll hear what it says, uh, because I think this is the proper understanding of the text. Being asked by the Pharisees, and you'll notice now the question, when is the kingdom of God coming? You remember, you don't ask, where is it? Or when you do ask, where is it? You mean, where is it in terms of, when is it breaking on the scene? Where do I go out to see it happening in terms of a time coming? Their question is, when the kingdom of God was coming? Jesus answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Now, we're going to have to come back and deal with that idea a little bit later in this evening, <clears throat> but it's of some considerable significance that you hear that. The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, 
nor will they say, Lo, here it is, or there. For, Jesus said, Behold, the kingdom of God <coughs> is in the midst of you. Now, the King James Version translated that within you. The New, Inter the New International Version perpetuates that translation. The kingdom of God is within you. The word can mean either within or among. The problem is, which does it mean? And it is very, very difficult for me to imagine that Jesus meant the kingdom of God is within you. For a couple of reasons. First of all, there is not another hint of any kind in the entire teaching of Jesus that would even remotely suggest such an idea. That spiritualizes the kingdom in a way that is radically foreign to the teaching of Jesus. He doesn't think of the kingdom as some spiritual idea. Furthermore, the whole context of this is Jesus is speaking to Pharisees. It is nearly impossible to imagine that Jesus would have said to a group of Pharisees, now look, don't go running around here and there looking for the kingdom because the kingdom of God is within you. And that is to absolutely miss the point of the text. What he is trying to say to the Pharisees is that don't go running around every place when somebody says there's evidence of the kingdom out here and there and everywhere else. The next time somebody crosses the Jordan with a group of 400 people ready to march on Rome, don't go running out there to say the kingdom of God is here. Because Jesus says the kingdom of God is already in your midst. It's already actively at work among you. Now, there can be no text that is more clear than that one in terms of the fact of the presentness of the kingdom. But there are other texts that make it equally clear. One of them, for example, is Luke 16, 16. <clears throat> Again, a text that has some difficulties in it, but the point I'm trying to make right at this moment is not difficult. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news... Now notice the, the way this divides history. Remember our little this age and the age to come? And the law and the prophets were until John. And Jesus says now from John's time until the moment he spoke these words, he said, the kingdom of God is being preached and everyone enters it violently. And you understand whatever that means, and we'll come back to that. I think there's an answer to that. But the point I'm trying to make is that it is being preached and people are entering it. It is now something those who are hearing Jesus are entering in the proclamation of Jesus. So again, the kingdom of God is a present reality in a text like this. Now, there is one other set of texts that are equally clear and in this case are particularly significant. This is a group of texts trying to locate these now. One of them, I think, is in Luke uh, 11, 18. Suddenly it occurs to me that I can't put my finger on the exact place. <clears throat> no, it's 11, 20. <clears throat> it's in the Beelzebul controversy. Now, the Beelzebul controversy is taken up, you remember, with regard to Jesus' authority to cast out demons. And what Jesus is saying to them if I cast out demons, if you, you're accusing me of casting out demons by Satan. He says, now, that's ridiculous. That means a kingdom is divided against itself and cannot stand. Besides, if I cast out demons by Satan, by whom do your people cast them out? Since there were exorcisms that were going on in Judaism with regularity. <clears throat> but he says, you've got another alternative. <clears throat> if I by the finger or spirit of God cast out demons, that means the kingdom of God has come present upon you. Now that's the choice you have. If I, by the spirit of God, cast out demons, that means God's kingdom has come present in your midst. Now very closely related to that kind of text is the one in Matthew 11, verses 2 to 5, you remember that uh, John the Baptist is having difficulty with Jesus, and I'm going to come back and comment on that in a few moments also. <clears throat> and he finally sends some of his disciples to Jesus. Are you the coming one, or do we look for somebody else? 
And Jesus says, go back and tell John what you see and hear. And what he in effect does is takes the promises out of Isaiah 61.1 and says, these things are now happening. And anybody who is, and so let no one be offended in me. Blessed is the one who is not offended in me. And what he uses as evidence is his, the reversal of order, the overthrow of Satan's reign, the blind see, the lame walk, the oppressed are being set free. The poor have the good news proclaimed to them. This, Jesus says, is the evidence that Isaiah 61.1 is being fulfilled in your hearing, which is exactly the point that is made in the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke 4.16 and following, where on this particular day they open to the prophet Isaiah, and this is a clearly messianic text that has to do with the great coming day of the Lord which is going to be evidenced by the Spirit of God upon the Messiah and the great reversal. The blind see, the lame walk, the oppressed are set free, the prisoners are set free, and the poor are hearing the good news from God. And Jesus says, this day, <clears throat> this is being fulfilled in your hearing. Now, all of those texts together, plus a number of other kinds of evidence indicate that for Jesus himself, the kingdom of God was in fact a present reality in his own ministry. As we suggested last night in conclusion in a hurry, <clears throat> that was <clears throat> for him partly evidenced in the fact of his eating with sinners. Remember one of the great truths of the coming of the rule of God was going to be the great reversal and the great reversal is the people that expected to be in are going to be end up being out. And those who don't expect it are going to be in. And a part of that was the Messianic banquet motif. <clears throat> it is in this context that Jesus regularly places his sitting at table with tax collectors, prostitutes, people. And those two tend to be at the very bottom of the rung of the category sinners in the view of the Pharisees. And Jesus is eating with them. And his view of eating with them is now is not a time for fasting. Now is a time for feasting because the bridegroom is with them. There will come a time for fasting. But now is feasting time. Now we are celebrating the coming of the rule of God and the overthrow or the beginning of the overthrow of Satan's reign. Now, the most significant event in the ministry of Jesus, or events in the ministry of Jesus, that for him indicated the presentness of the kingdom was, in fact, the engaging of the holy war in terms of the Messiah taking on Satan on Satan's turf and overthrowing Satan in his rule. This is the great significance of that word that Jesus says to John, ba John the Baptist's disciples. The, the overthrow is now taking place. Don't be offended in me. <clears throat> or more significantly in the Beelzebul controversy. This comes out more <clears throat> clearly, I think, in Mark's version of that controversy in Mark chapter 3, <clears throat> somewhere around verses 22 and following. And you remember that at the conclusion of the Beelzebul controversy, <clears throat> we have this rather remarkable little parable by Jesus. It's a kind of a parabolic statement that a strong man can keep his house until a stronger man comes and binds the strong man and when that happens then the stronger man having bound the strong man can spoil his house. Now in that saying there can be no question as to who is who. Satan is the strong man. He has in fact bound people by demonic possession and by oppression. Jesus is God's stronger man who has come and is, who has bound the strong man as, and is in the process of spoiling his house. And the point Jesus is making is that every single person who has been delivered from the power of Satan by the casting out of demons and by the healing of sickness, and you understand in the Hebrew mind those things join together, that is the demonic and sickness are seen to have ultimately the same source. Sickness comes because 
of the presence and power of Satan. Remember, that was a part of the evidence from last night's little diagram, this age in the age to come. One of the evidences of this age is the prevalence of sickness, people dying always with all kinds of sickness. Jesus sees his ministry of casting out demons and healing the sick as the evidence that God's stronger man has come and has bound the strong man and is in the process of overthrowing his house. So that, you know, that that's the point of the saying in Luke 10, 18. Uh, where he says, I beheld Satan fall from heaven. And this comes after the 72, you remember, I've returned and said, wow, we were really in it. Demons were being cast out in the name of Jesus. And he says, well, behold, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Now, that isn't referring to some primeval fall of Satan. That's referring to the fact that Satan has been bound by the ministry of Jesus and is in the process of being done in, of being destroyed. Nonetheless, don't rejoice in that. Rejoice, your names are in heaven, Jesus said. But the point of that text at this point, of course, is the, is the overthrow of Satan that is being evidenced by Jesus' own ministry. Now, you understand that in the New Testament, Jesus does not perform miracles because he's God. In the New Testament, the evidence is very clear. He performed miracles because the Spirit and the power of God were with him, to use the language of the Bible. The power of God was present with him to heal. Or to use Luke's language in the Gospel, he went forth in the power of the Spirit. And it is the coming of the Spirit <clears throat> that is this <clears throat> evidence in Jesus as Messiah. <clears throat> the Messiah is the one who is going to uniquely uh, be the one who had the Spirit, as the texts in Isaiah regularly remind us. And precisely because he was the unique bearer of the Spirit, this was the evidence that the age of the Spirit was dawning, that the new age was coming. <clears throat> now that is a point that I should have made last night and did not. One of the things that happens when you speak off the top of your head. One of the things that happened in, the, in that Old Testament expectation was a looking for the age to come as an age of the Spirit. In fact, the coming of the Spirit was going to be the one thing that was going to mark the division of the ages. This age, remember, is Satan's age. It's going to be brought to a conclusion by the coming age. And this is going to be the kingdom of God. And it is going to be evidenced above everything else by spirit. Now, I don't want to go into this in too great detail, but this is absolutely crucial to understanding the Apostle Paul <clears throat> and well, the rest of the New Testament, Luke obviously also. But what happened was, of course, that everybody came to believe that the prophets spoke because they were inspired by the Spirit. Evidence of that comes very easily in the language, for example, is it in 1st, 2nd Peter, 2nd Peter. The holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. You know, that, that, isn't somebody, that isn't something somebody is trying to prove, you understand? He's not trying to prove biblical inspiration. All he's trying to just say is what everybody believed, that the prophets spoke because they spoke by the power of the Spirit. <clears throat> what happened is, at the end of the time of the prophetic period, <clears throat> this time when the gloom began to settle in in Israel, they began to look for the Spirit to come in fullness, but they looked for that to come at the end. <clears throat> and in the process, there happened in Israel the concept of what we call the time of the quenched Spirit. Evidence for this lies in all kinds of documents. Josephus mentions it. It's mentioned in one of the Maccabees. It is mentioned even in one of the latter prophecies of the Old Testament in Zechariah. You remember? That in Zechariah, what is it, 12, 13, somewhere in there, <clears throat> it says, And if a young man grows up in that day and says, I'm a prophet, his parents should slay him through, because there is going to be no prophetic voice in the land. There is a time of the quieting, or to use the language of scholarship, it is the time of the quenched spirit. There is no spirit of God speaking in the land. What happened then is that the prophecy of Joel was looked upon as a totally eschatological event. That is, not something that was going to happen in history, but was pushed out to the age to come. So that at the final end, at the end of time, there was going to be 
the fulfillment of the Joel prophecy, and of course the point of the Joel prophecy is not just a prophet here and there, but all of God's people are going to be prophets. Old, young, men, women. And, and to make sure that, the, that, the, that it goes you know, to the ultimate of, of the pecking order of human beings, even on my female slaves in those days, will I pour out of my spirit. Now, everybody in the new age is going to be prophet, according to the biblical hope and the biblical expression. Now, what happened was that since there was a quieted or a time of no spirit, you remember the mentioned people we mentioned last night called the apocalyptists? The thing that is common of all of these apocalyptic writers is that they wrote not under their own name, but under the name of somebody from antiquity. They wrote in the name of Enoch, Abraham, Moses, Baruch, you name it. They wrote under somebody else's name. We call that pseudepigraphy. But the reason for their doing that is not because they were trying to put something over on somebody that was a lie. The reason for their doing that is they wanted to speak prophetically, but they couldn't speak prophetically because there was no spirit in the land. So that the only way they could speak to their present age was to go back and in the name of somebody who did have the spirit, speak in that person's name. So the people, the ancient worthies, the people of the Spirit are now speaking in this age precisely because there is no Spirit in the land. Now it is into this kind of context that you'll have to understand the prophecy of, for example, John the Baptist who says, no, I'm not it. And the clearest evidence that I'm not it is all I'm doing is baptizing in the mere paltry element water. It's preparatory. It doesn't mean zip compared to the real thing. And the real thing, he says, is evidenced by spirit. When the Messiah comes, he is going to usher in the messianic age. Now, John didn't say it that way. How did he say it? He said when the Messiah comes, he's going to do what? Baptize in Holy Spirit and power. And that was John's way of announcing, and the reason he used the word baptism is because that was what he was doing. In contrast to what he was doing, baptizing in water, there's going to come the Messiah, and he's going to baptize all right, but when he does it, it's going to baptize the real thing. He's going to usher in the age to come by the coming of the Spirit. Now, you understand the significance, therefore, of the event in the, in the water, in the, in the river for Jesus, <clears throat> when it says the Spirit came upon him. And it was the Spirit that drove him into the desert. It was the Spirit that brought him into Galilee. And everything that he did, he did by the Spirit, we're told in the Gospels. Why? Because it is the coming of the Spirit upon Jesus that authenticated him as Messiah and evidenced the coming of the new age. The new age had dawned in the coming of Jesus. Well, now that's where all of the problems lie. How can something be both present and future at the same time? And especially something as cataclysmic and dynamic as the coming new age of God that all God's people had all these years been looking for. Well... <clears throat> That brings us to a little section then of this lecture <laughs> that we'll have to call the mystery of the kingdom. The mystery of the kingdom. Now the mystery of the kingdom, it's the language of Jesus. What becomes clear in the teaching of Jesus is that there are two things about his ministry that come under the category of finally being the new thing he did with regard to teaching about the kingdom or the meaning of the kingdom of God. Now, one of those, and <clears throat> this is the one that <clears throat> we've already spent some time with, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time elaborating. One of those has to do with the fact that the new age, in fact, came present in Jesus himself. Now, what I mean by that is that that is so contrary to their expectations. To put it in the language of the American black comedian Flip Wilson, their problem 
with the kingdom or with Jesus is what they saw was what they got. What you see is what you get. And what they see is not what they're expecting. What are they expecting? What are their categories? Power, triumph, signs, big. The bigger, the more genuinely it must be God's thing. God, you know, only does things big, only. And I mean big, like big, 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 big. Kawhali, God's in it, it's gotta be so big, you can't miss it. Splash, triumph, power, glory. And whatever else it's gonna mean, it's gonna mean that God is gonna come and smash those hated enemies of ours and, you know, run their noses in the dirt. Gonna get rid of those blankety blank Romans. When God comes on the scene, he is gonna smash the enemy and exalt his people Israel. Now what they see is what they get. And what they see hardly fits their expectations. This is such mixed company that many of you won't catch some of my American, <clears throat> American jokes. But I have a very close friend who, <clears throat> who calls this kind of attitude the hardening of the categories. <clears throat> that comes from a, there's a, there's a, a sickness for those of you who are non-Americans. There's a, a sickness or an illness called hardening of the arteries. And he has just said, this is hardening of the categories. Well, that's really what it is. Their categories are so hardened that they simply, they're looking for a square and they get a triangle and they can't fit it. It just doesn't square. Nothing works. He doesn't come the way you would expect him to come. I mean, what in the world is this peasant carpenter from Nazareth doing, walking around Galilee with his motley crew of outsiders who don't have any influence, no money, no power, in any way, shape, or form to get his program going, what has he got to do with God's kingdom? That's the problem. That's the mystery of the kingdom. The mystery of the kingdom is what they're getting is not what they're expecting. They're looking for God's king to come with a triumphant white horse and all of his army, and he's going to just do his thing and do it big. Remember how many times in the ministry of Jesus they ask him the question, show us a sign. Show us a sign. Show us a sign. Why do they keep asking that of Jesus? Because they've got their minds made up as to how the Messiah is going to function, and what they get in Jesus is something that is so completely different from that, and it's not that they're believing that he's the Messiah. Their problem is that he does so many things with authority, they can't put it together. Here is a person who in his own name teaches, in his own name casts out demons, who has all the, the power and authority and, and a certain de in a certain level, in a certain way he's going about things, but he does everything wrong, everything wrong. He hasn't done one single thing right. He doesn't get born in the right place. He doesn't get... You know, he isn't raised in the right place. He doesn't go to the right schools. He doesn't do anything right. And then of all things, he goes around with the wrong kind of people. He doesn't even hobnob with the religious. He hobnobs with the poor, the outcast, sinners. I mean, nothing about him is right. That's why John the Baptist finally sa sends some disciples and says, Hey, are you the coming one? Or do we start looking for somebody else? You've got to take seriously that John the Baptist had serious doubts about Jesus. And the reason is because John had hardening of the categories too. He couldn't believe that Jesus could have been the Messiah no matter what had happened in the, in, in the, in the, in the river. Because Jesus simply didn't fit. Remember John's great words of announcement of judgment? The winnowing fork is in his hand. I mean, John's ready for God to do something with real action. And Jesus never does anything right. Even his disciples who get clued, on, clued in along the way, even they don't quite dig it. Remember, he goes through one town and he's rejected. And what did the disciples say? Fire from heaven. Boy, let's... <laughs> I mean, we're with, the, we're with the big guy now. Let's see some big action. 
I mean, even after he tries to communicate to them the way it really is, remember? And that was the point we made yesterday morning, not in this set of tapes, but in the Markan context. And I don't want to go back all, all the way back through that because we already did that. But remember when finally Jesus discloses the nature of his Messiahship? That he's going to be a suffering servant? I mean, there's no way they can believe God's powerful Messiah is going to be a suffering servant. Remember Paul says, Jews seek signs. Greeks seek wisdom. We preach, Paul, you have got to be out of your head. We preach a crucified Messiah. You can't have a crucified Messiah. You understand? That's a contradiction in terms. A Messiah, yes. A crucified person, yes. But that's 180 degrees on the opposite ends of the circle. Those two could never get together. That's like saying fried ice. You can't have fried ice. You can't have a crucified Messiah. Messiah means power, triumph, glory. Crucifixion is the ultimate pitch. That was the worst possible thing that could have ever happened to a human being. The worst. It is the ultimate expression of degradation and weakness. No God in his right mind would have ever got mixed up in that kind of business. That's the problem with God. He doesn't think like us. You know, he didn't consult us for wisdom. If he'd only consulted us for wisdom, we could have given him a program that would have set the thing up and got people on his side. And I have no problem. I can set up a program get the world to go after Jesus. I have no trouble with that at all. Anywhere. Just take this room. Count off by fours. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay? All the way around. One's right here. Two's, three's, fours. Okay? Put the ones right out here in the middle and say, the rest of you watch. Here's what happens to people who don't obey God. <laughs> That's the end of the ones. <laughs> You're not going to have any trouble with the twos. Come on. When they say, jump, you jump. I mean, <laughs> how do you think Mohammed conquered the world? By sticking a sword at people's throats. That's how he conquered. It wasn't on the truth. It was on the basis of sticking swords in their necks. You need anybody to follow God if they think they're going to get their head lopped off along the way. Well, not everybody, but you know, the majority of people. I mean, you're not going to have any trouble. I mean, why didn't he act just a little bit more like a god? In the world is this Jesus doing who goes around and everything he does is all wrong and everything is in weakness I mean who's gonna get anybody to follow him by his being crucified a crucified Messiah can you imagine such a thing it's unthinkable Besides all that, when your Bible says cursed by God is everybody that hangs on a tree, you've got double indemnity. I mean, not only is it stupid, but the Bible's against it. God himself is against it. I mean, you've got trouble in your hands trying to preach a crucified Messiah in that world. Greeks, Jews want signs. Greeks want wisdom. And we preach a crucified Messiah. And it's a stumbling block to those seeking signs, and it's foolishness to those asking for wisdom. But for those who are being saved, it is Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. You say, boy, how can that work out? Well, the answer lies way back there. And you remember, they can't handle Jesus. Even after he's disclosed that this is what's going to happen to him, he's going to be a suffering Messiah. Remember that he does that? You know what they do? They go along the road, they're going down the road asking, what? Who's the greatest in the kingdom? And what answer does he give them? Huh? What answer does he give to who's the greatest in the kingdom? Now, not in this case, the child, the little child. I mean, Children didn't have status in that culture. And Jesus says, oh, you want to know what the greatest in the kingdom is? See this child? Except you become like that. To people who are asking, who's the greatest? That's got to be the low blow. And then they still don't get it. I mean, right after that, he tries them again. You know, he says, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. 
He does that three times. After the third time, you know what they do along the road? Two brothers come and say, when you come in your kingdom, I want to sit in one place of authority and my other brother would like the other place of authority. <laughs> but don't laugh at them. That's exactly where you and I are. We're forever thinking Jesus did it all wrong and are trying to transform him into something different that looks a little bit more like our own images. And his answer to that particular question is, look, that's the way the pagans are. Their chief people lord it over them, but it shall not be so among you. He who would be the leader of all must be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's pretty tough stuff. Now that is the first part of the mystery of the kingdom. This is why Jesus says such interesting things in his parables. The kingdom of God is like the smallest of all the seeds. It doesn't look like it's got a ghost of a chance. But when it finally comes to consummation, it is a herb so big that the birds of the air can find a place to nest in its branches. The kingdom of God is like leaven. It doesn't amount to zilch. I mean, it's nothing. But somehow when it's placed in that, the whole thing is finally penetrated by that. It's like seed growing secretly. It, it's, it's like the kind of thing we're not looking for. We're not expecting anything out of this. Jesus is saying the kingdom of God doesn't come the way we are looking. That's why, then back to that text in Luke 17, don't, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. It's not going to come with those powerful displays that they're looking for. It's going to come the way it has already made its entrance, namely in the coming of Jesus, who is himself the entrance and the beginning of the kingdom of God. Okay, so one part of the kingdom is what I call the nature of the messiahship, the nature of, of what kind of messiah they're getting on their hands. The other side, which is the other side of the same coin of the secret of the kingdom, is that the dramatic inbreaking of the rule of God that they were looking for had in fact begun with Jesus of Nazareth. That's the thing. That is that the kingdom was in fact already on the scene. And it was on the scene in Jesus. The point I'm trying to stress now is that in Jesus, it has already made the scene. Now, that's the thing that we want to just establish for a few minutes, for, for a little bit in the next few minutes. You remember that they're looking for this dramatic ending of history. What they get is Jesus. And instead of being anything like a dramatic conclusion to history, they have a servant Messiah whom even those who recognize him as Messiah cannot penetrate to understand what he's doing. And Jesus says the kingdom is already here. It's already present. And they couldn't believe it. Now, the question that we raised a bit ago and that we're going to go back to answer is, how can something be both present and future at the same time? And the answer to that, you understand, lies in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. It lies in the person of the king. If I can put it in the simplest kinds of terms, I always wince a little bit when, I, <clears throat> when I'm saying this because my scholarly instincts want to say it differently, but it's all right, it's still basically true. Where the king is, there the kingdom is. Where the king is exercising his sovereign authority, God's kingdom is present. That's exactly the point. The kingdom, you see, is not a place that we're going to. It's a time that God ushers in. But rather than being the dramatic conclusion to history they were looking for, it turns out to be like mustard seed being planted in the ground. It turns out to be like Jesus. But it turns out that in Jesus, God's rule is in fact already present and taking place. Now, 
What scholars have learned to do in terms of this is to, to use language here, and this is the language I'm going to spend the rest of this evening on because it's so important to the entire New Testament, including some things we said in this morning's class that several of you suggested afterwards that you wish we'd say just a little bit more about this wealth and health, uh, this prosperity doctrine especially. The key to understanding the entire New Testament, everything in the New Testament, is to find the proper framework into which to fit everything. And that framework is the fact that the kingdom of God in Jesus was both present and future simultaneously. Now the language we use for that is that it was both already and not yet. And it was both at the same time. It was already making its way felt in the world because the king had already come. It was not yet in the sense that what had begun had not yet reached its final consummation. To put that in other kinds of scholarly language, the kingdom of God was inaugurated with the coming of Jesus. It is going to be consummated at the second coming of Jesus. But it is already. In fact, that is quite the point of the whole New Testament, that God's rule has already begun. It has begun in our world. It has already made its presence known. The Spirit has already come and is available to all God's people already. That is not something that is yet to come. That is what has already taken place. Jesus Christ has already dealt Satan the decisive, absolutely crucial blow in the great holy war. And where was that? In the cross and subsequent resurrection. If there is anything that belongs to the future, it is resurrection. What's going to happen at the end? Resurrection. That is one of the things that everybody agreed in the great future time of God, there is going to be resurrection. What happened is that the future, and I'm going to give some language that's going to sort of boggle your minds, but it's okay. We'll just keep with it until it finally penetrates. What happens in Jesus is that the future made its way into the present already. And the evidence of it is in the resurrection. Because in the resurrection, Jesus of Nazareth, in the power of God, grappled with the enemy at his last final stronghold and stranglehold over humankind. And he triumphed over the enemy at his final point of power, namely death. When we celebrate Easter, a week from next Sunday, we are celebrating not just the raising of Jesus from the dead. We are celebrating the fact that God has entered human history and has taken Satan by the throat and has conquered him at his absolutely most powerful point, namely death, and has already overcome death. Now we still die. But the difference, because the resurrection has happened, is all the difference of night and day. The resurrection means that the resurrection has already begun. And therefore, our resurrection is guaranteed by the resurrection that has already taken place. Our resurrection is not yet, but the resurrection is already. And precisely because it has already happened, there is no question about our future. Our future is the future of those who are raised in Christ Jesus. Now, we haven't experienced that yet. We've experienced some of the you know, what I call the initial breath of the power of it. And our entire lives as believers in the New Testament is an existence 
in this tension between the already and not yet. Now, you miss that tension and you're going to go into heresy of one kind or another. Or, if not heresy, you're going to go into some abuses of understanding the New Testament. This, by the way, is biblical language. John says it, doesn't he? 1 John 3. Already we are the children of God, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Now, are we going to be different from what we are? Well, yes and no. Okay? Already we're what we're going to be, but we are not yet what we're going to be. I know that sounds strange, but that's simply the way it is. Everything in the New Testament is predicated on that reality. Already we are what we're going to be, but we're not yet what we're going to be. Already we are God's children. It just hasn't yet come into that whole fullness that we're going to someday know and experience. You're still looking at me with that puzzled look. I'm going to try it one more time, this time with an illustration. Because if you don't get this, you miss everything. I mean, I might as well close the New Testament. Everything is predicated on this understanding. I could take you from here and for the next 50 hours simply go through the New Testament page by page by page and show you that everything in the New Testament, Paul's understanding of justification is ultimately predicated on this, on this framework. Justification for Paul happens when? In the, in the past or in the future? Huh? Yeah, both, exactly. It's already happened and it's going to happen. But what's going to happen is predicated on what's already happened. Now you understand that that is so radicalized, Paul, that his entire existence was changed by coming to grips with that one reality. As a Jew, when did he expect to be justified? Huh? As a Jew, what kind of understanding of justification did he have? Future. And when in the future? At the end. I mean, when the books are open, Paul. <laughs> or and one or the other. The problem that Paul experienced was he didn't know which it was going to be. That's why Romans 7 is not the experience of his living as a Christian. It's the experience of his living as a man under law. And you cannot make that a Christian life because the whole problem of Romans 7 has to do with what is it like to be a person under law. Whatever else Paul was, he wasn't a person under law. Now the point of that passage is very clear. Under law, what happens? You can never be sure. Why? Because what does law do? Save? Huh? What law continually does is demonstrate how far wrong you are. It's the mirror that shows you where the dirt is all over your face, but it doesn't have a single ounce of water and soap to do anything about it. And every time the law is read, Paul says, blindness and guilt and condemnation. Why? Because the law says, thou shalt not covet. And I didn't even know I was covetous until the law said, thou shalt not covet. And then the sin that was already resident in me sprang to life and I died. I didn't lie, die because of the law. I died because of the sin that was resident in my life. It was the law that made me aware of my deadly existence. And he cries out in his anxiety, who can deliver me from this deadly existence? And the reason for it is because Paul expected down here at the end to be justified or not justified. At the end of his life, at the eschaton, God was going to pronounce okay or no okay. And he lived in absolute anxiety because the law said in order to be okay, you got to be like this. And here's Paul struggling along down here under here being what he was. You know what happened to Paul on the Damascus Road? God took justification out of the future and put it in his past. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation. That word is a judicial term still. There is no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the law of sin and flesh, but who live in the Spirit. It was removing justification from the future and putting in his past that guaranteed the future justification. And that's what freed him up. He didn't have to work in order to be justified. He was already justified that freed him up to work. And the difference was the difference of night and day. Already, not yet.
Everything is to be understood within that eschatological framework. Well, I'll go to the illustration. This illustration comes right out of Switzerland. Oscar Kuhlmann teaches at Basel. World War II. Do any of you have faint, dim, distant recollections of in school studying about World War II? Sorry, some of us lived through the war. Yeah. I mean, we're dating ourselves, but it's okay. I think what the thing is overwhelming me is that I teach young people for whom the war is only something they've read about. And suddenly I'm aware of how old I really am. I mean, our lives were so determined by World War II that we're still marked by what happened during that war. We can't help ourselves. That's the way we are. So this illustration comes out of World War II. You ever heard of D-Day? Can you give me the date of D-Day? June 6, 1944. What happened on D-Day? The largest armada in human military history that had been assembling for for over a year and England and every place else where it was possible in the northern Atlantic. And on D-Day, June 6, 1944, in the form of five huge armies, they crossed the channel and established a foothold on Normandy and planted the Allied flags and said, this is our turf. 20-hour day, at the end of that 20-hour day, five beachheads had been established. And they had been established in such a way that there was never, ever again any question about the outcome of the war. That had been determined at D-Day. On D-Day, with the planting of those Allied flags on Normandy, the soil of Normandy, they spelled the death knell to the Nazi regime. Can anybody give me the date of the next great event in the war? It's called V-Day and stands for the Day of Victory. Interesting. Interesting. Most Americans don't get it at all. And the reason most Americans don't get it is because we have two V-Days. Victory in Europe, and victory in Japan. And because of that, I can understand American confusion. I have taught this material for 18 years, and I've had only four people in all my life that could answer that question. Now, I want to suggest to you that that very fact is an interesting phenomenon. I'm surprised that my Norwegian friends cannot remember V-Day. Okay, you've got it. Good. I mean, I don't I expect that in Europe, you understand, because that was such a significant event in people's lives. The 8th of May, 1945. Get the dates. 6 6 5, well, I'll do it your way. 8 5 45. That's an 11 month period. V day. Never a question that this was going to happen. Never. It was just a matter of when. And the reason there was never a question is because that had already been decided here. Now, I understand that Americans, and I'm going to speak as an American, and I do that very gingerly when I come to the European soil, because we Americans sort of were latecomers in the war, and, and you know, we did it from a distance. We didn't experience the kind of suffering that the Europeans did. But what you need to hear from an American is that more American lives were lost in that 11 month period than in all of the other years of the war, in all of the battlefronts. More lives lost right there. But there was never a question about how it was going to turn out. It wasn't a question of whether people were going to still die, whether there were still battles to be fought, there was never a question during those 
bitter winter months in the Battle of the Bulge as to whether it was really going to happen or not. There was only one question, and that was when. Now that is exactly how the New Testament understands the kingdom of God. In the coming of Jesus, God planted his flag on this enemy turf and said, This is my planet. I claim it in the name of the cross. And through the resurrection, he declared that there is going to be a V-day that is going to consummate what has begun. And our entire existence is lived in the certainty of the future, predicated on what has already happened in the past. There's never a question about how it's going to come out. It is simply a matter of when it's going to come to its conclusion. There has never been a promise that we're not going to have to fight battles. There has never been a single promise that we're not going to die. What we have been promised is that we win no matter what happens. We win if we live. We win if we die. We win in rejoicing. We win in suffering. We win because God has already done the winning. It is simply a matter of His bringing it to conclusion. And He's inviting us to be a part of the mop-up operation. And the mop-up operation is what you and I are engaged in. And that may cost us our lives, but so what? When did that become important? You say, you're crazy. No, I'm not crazy. I'm, I'm Christian. I'm New Testament. The future has already entered the present age. God has already triumphed. He has already secured my life. And what he is asking us to do is to live the future in the present age. We live between the times, living out the future that is to come, but living it out in the present age. Always living out the future, but living it in the present. That's why we're going to be crazy. Because our values are not existent or predicated on the present age. Our values have to do with the new age, God's kingdom. It has to do with a future that God has already inaugurated in Jesus Christ. But discipleship still means the cross. To eliminate the cross is to eliminate too much. It's to eliminate the whole thing. That's the nature of our discipleship all the way to the end. But we win. That's why the great picture in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. Jesus, there's two pictures, simultaneously, one to be understood in light of the other one. The Messiah is about to be born. And in the process of his about to be born, Satan is going to swallow him up. But instead, what happens? He's caught up to heaven. John says, let's try another picture and we'll get this thing in better perspective. When that happened, he says it was like war taking place in heaven. The angels of God, led by the great archangel, and Satan and his hosts were in great conflict in the great battle that Jesus Christ Messiah was engaged in. And what happened? Satan lost. He was cast down out of heaven. And what happened when he was cast down out of heaven? It says that immediately they sprang into joy singing, Rejoice, O heavens, because salvation has come. And then it says, Woe to you on earth, because Satan has been cast down to you, and he knows his time is limited, and he's going to wreak his havoc on the people of God. But John says it's okay, because they overcame him, how? By the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their own lives even unto death. Have you ever noticed in the New Testament that rejoicing and suffering are always brought together? You rejoice in suffering, you rejoice in suffering. That doesn't mean because, oh, I'm going to rejoice. I mean, it's not because we're a bunch of crazies, it's because we're really crazy. And the reason we are so is because our lives have been secured by the eternal God. We don't have to secure our existence anymore. God's rule has come. And because God's rule has come, that's freed me from the need to secure my own existence. And even in suffering, one can rejoice. That doesn't mean we look for suffering to rejoice in. We simply rejoice in suffering because that's the nature of our living out in this present age. Now we're off the air. I'm going to tell a story. Sorry, I mean, 